We are now reconvening in open session. This is the Northampton School Committee's regular meeting of January 10th, 2013. We've just uh, uh, come out of an executive session and we're returning to the regular agenda of the open meeting. Uh, the next item on our agenda is some organizational matters. Um, and uh, the two items that you have on there for organization is the election of a vice chairperson and setting the annual meeting schedule. Um, I've, been, I've received a number of questions about this issue of the election of a vice chair. Your current rules call for the annual election of, of a vice chair. Um, in consulting with the city solicitor and looking at the, at the new charter, um, if the school committee wishes to elect, uh, uh, go ahead and, and have an election for vice chair this month, that would be fine. But going forward, after the next municipal election, the vice chair under the charter would be elected at the start of the term and would serve for the duration of the term, uh, for the two-year term. That's the intent. That's the, the language of the charter. So the, the, um, that would be going forward. So that for, for this for the remainder of this term, uh, it would be appropriate if if that's what the school committee wishes to do is to, if they would like to have that election, um, they could do that. Uh, Ms. Minnick. Table the election of vice chairperson until a February meeting. I'll explain why. So you would like to postpone consideration of that, uh, postpone the the election. Okay. So I'll there's been that. a motion to postpone, and it's been seconded. Okay. My rationale is um, that I believe that the rules and policy subcommittee on Monday will have a meeting that will be considering the rules of procedure in light of the charter revision, and there is just a lot of stuff in there that's going to need to be cleaned up and made to match. And my feeling is that until such time as another vice chair is elected, the vice chair from last year will continue to serve. And indeed, we may decide that we don't even need to have the election of a new vice chair. But if we chose to make arrangements during this transition period, I just think it should be clear right now there is language in our existing rules of procedure regarding the length of the term and the number of terms that a, a vice chair can serve. And I think if we can have a chance to clean up the rules of procedure, then everything might be more straightforward in electing a vice chair if we chose to do that. Otherwise, the existing vice chair would just continue to serve. That is my rationale for making that motion. Okay. And, and you and that personal thing, okay, it's just a procedural. And that committee's meeting on Monday. That's correct. So, Mr. Moore. Yes, um, my concern with this motion in front of us is that we will need to have a vice chair during the coming year um, until the next term starts and the rules of the new charter take effect. And uh, it's been my understanding that Stephanie has said she would rather not continue as the vice chair this coming year. And so I think I would like to ask Stephanie. I'm, I'm willing to see what happens at rules and policy, um, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm okay with this. I, I think it makes some sense to talk it through first. It would probably because then, who, if if there was someone running, they'd at least know the parameters based on the rules of what they'd be running uh, under. So that would be good. So. When is rules and policy? Monday, Monday. the 14th, the 14th at one, one to three. Yeah, one. Mm -hmm. Have to consider your schedule. So, um, <laughs> is there any other discussion about the motion to postpone consideration of the election of a vice chairperson uh, until the next meeting? Harry? I just have one question in regards to um, the population, the populating of uh, our, our subcommittees. Mm -hmm. if that would still happen in the month of January, and if it did, would our current vice chair do that? According to the charter, all subcommittees are now named by the chair. So that, that person won't change. Yeah, that is correct. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and so that would be, uh, that is one of those issues too that is, is actually tied into the rules because the charter um, 
that is an issue that the school committee will need to look at whether it intends to have its committees uh, change every January or whether it will have its committees serve for the term for the two-year term um, so that will be an issue that needs to be looked at as chair uh, my intent is to keep the committees the same until we after we have that discussion um, and um, if that means just I'll reappoint I'm reappointing them all the same committees I can do that or if we want to postpone until we've until the rules committee has had a chance to look at that question um, but I, I, I actually don't believe, yeah. Because yeah. we talked about canceling that meeting because we weren't the rules policy committee. And I actually think that you're, I mean, even looking at your, the current rules, that I, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree that all the committees dissolve at the strike of New Year's every year, that I think the, con the current c committees can continue to function until such time that new committees are appointed. So. And I think particularly so given the, which yeah. Loophole or whatever the right word is, I suggested that we wait on the vice chair vote because I think the existing vice chair will continue to serve in that capacity until we change something. Mm -hmm. right. Serve uh, as vice chair until someone else is elected or until she's reelected or until we change the rules. Uh, that would be correct. I mean, that's I think that's the intent of your motion. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Any other discussion about that? Um, okay, so the motion on the table then is to, is to postpone the election of a vice chair until your next meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, it's unanimous. Um, the next item is the setting of the annual meeting schedule. Um, and I believe you've received a copy of a proposed um, meeting schedule as it is known right now. Um, this is obviously always subject to change and so the other oh, there's a handout. Gone. Um, so uh, I, I, I guess the tradition has been that there's a motion to set the annual meetings. I'm not sure it's an agenda item, so I'm not sure if, it, if it's Just a point of information. Okay. So then as okay. a point of information, see if there are any concerns. the annual meeting schedule is posted um, for you to look at. Okay. May I comment? Uh, uh, certainly. I would uh, really hope that we would consider strongly adding other meetings in the months that are not the budget months. Um, the, during the last few years, uh, routinely had meetings that went until 11 o'clock at night, which I don't think serves any purpose. Um, and um, we've neglected to really pay attention to things. We, a couple of years ago, we started, we read a book about it being an effective school committee, and we've completely dropped that because we've been, our agendas have been completely filled up with just dealing with things we kind of had to do, urgent matters. Um, I think we need more time to do a good job of dealing with important things, and um, including us, our own self-evaluation as well as um, a number of other things that people have mentioned over the last couple of years. Um, I would really urge us, instead of thinking that, well, we do this big push at the budget time and then sort of just go back, <laughs> is to recognize that the, that the fall and even the summer are be really useful times to do a lot of the things that we talk about but never have time to do such as working on, oh, say, being a more effective body as a group, working for increased funding for schools, things like that. Okay, so there, that, and, I, and I think that, I don't know whether um, this is an issue that rules and policy discusses as in terms of whether or not the meeting dates have, or has been embedded in the rules or anything like that, or, or where, where the decision, how, how many meetings to have takes place. I don't know. We have, talked, we, we have changed our protocol many times over the years, and we have um, always had discussion here about how to do that. Um, and most recently, we, um, we decrease the number of subcommittee meetings that we have because especially for the for the curriculum committee, we as a full board felt that we should all be hearing what's going on in that meeting. In rules and policy, it's a little bit different because what they're, what they're doing is often tedious and they do a lot of legwork for us um, before it comes here. 
Um, and budget, we've kind of gone back and forth, but budget's always been a good kind of preparation for presenting um, to the board. Right. Um, but we have had we have had the discussion before that having two meetings a month allows us to have more time for philosophical discussion, for debate, for non-financial topics. Um, in the summertime, it's been hard because so many people are away at different points in the summer. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking about that for the, for the other three seasons, not just the budget season. Essentially, the fall is the time I'm looking at the calendar. Um, now, I don't know if when rules and policy looks at the, the bylaws, which talk about how often subcommittee meetings are meeting and what the, the regulations for that are, they might not also talk about some options and present that to us as a board. Okay. Ms. Minnick. Which says Tuesday, February the fifth. There's a full board meeting, a special meeting for. And it says it's at four, and I thought it was from six to seven thirty. Is it really at four? That's all I'm asking. I'll have to check. I thought it was at four. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Imagine. And, and I have six to seven thirty. You should keep in mind this is not the official meeting posting. We'll, yeah, they're I'm still required to post the meetings. So right. if there's clarification I just, I just that has to, to happen, I just my calendar yeah. properly. Mm -hmm. So I'm just clarifying. Um, but are you looking for a motion to approve this? Schedule? I'm told that you don't have. I was told that that was not necessary. I, I was actually, you know, when we were putting this together, I was unsure why it was on the agenda. But it, as I'm told, it's more for informational purposes. So. It's not an actual action item, I, I don't believe. Okay. Unless, and that may be something in the rules. It's, you know, the rules. it's, it's, it's 15.1 at the organizational meeting in January, the date and time of the regular meetings will be set. But and so I, I, that's why I asked, do we want a motion to set the schedule? But I, yeah. um, so I don't know, define what set means. Maybe it's we'll a, yeah. table this until the next meeting <laughs> and set it at our real live organizational meeting. Again, I, I um, <laughs> we're on a roll tonight. I think it's a good opportunity to kind of look at all these things with a fresh, you know, clean slate and, and figure out whether they make sense anymore. Just well, I just have a question on the Joint School Committee and the City Council meeting. Um, do you know if it's going to be here this year because it was not here last year or is it here? I mean, I don't remember. I was actually going to announce that a little bit later, okay. but it's, it is, um, I can actually say it's on there. It's, it's going to be held here. That's, yeah. Okay, that's what yeah. Any other questions about setting the schedule? Okay, so I think we've acknowledged this could be a, still a work in progress. Uh, and so, but this at least gives the outline of what the schedule will look like. I did go through and check for the Jewish Okay, so it's all kosher and... It's, it's a kosher calendar. Kosher calendar, that's good. Okay, all right, so then we will now um, uh, move along to the, in, to the next item on the agenda, which is our public comment period. And we have uh, one uh, a resident who signed up to speak in public comment, uh, Gina Norton-Smith. Gina. Hello. <coughs> Do I need to say my address? You can certainly state it, just okay. name and address. 37 for Murphy Terrace, Northampton. And I have uh, two children, one at the high school and one uh, here at JFK. Um, I'm here to talk about um, the incident in December, and um, I first want to commend you for how seriously you took the threat that appeared at the high school. Um, I'm very pleased that you, the school administrators reacted so quickly and um, uh, to keep the students safe. But I also want to say that I wish you had taken it even more serious, and by that I mean by what your response was in terms of the entire student body. I'm dismayed by what I read in the newspaper about this pledge that students were provided to sign. I'm dismayed that my child was required to give police evidence. Since when in this country are people required to give evidence against, potentially against themselves to police? I am dismayed that he was not given a choice to provide this evidence. 
when he, he asked if he was required to do it. He was told he was required to do it. And then to be found out later, he was, it was not required. I am dismayed that now that the police have a sample of my child's handwriting, and I'm concerned that this sample of my child's handwriting will become part of his, a police file that he now has that will follow him the rest of his life. I am concerned that I don't know what this pledge that my son signed says. I don't know what it says. I, I don't know what he was pledging to do. I feel like I should be uh, told what it was that he was required to fill out. This wasn't uh, an acknowledgment of what's in the school conduct code. This went beyond that. And I know it's in the school conduct code. You send it home to me. This you did not send home to me. I am concerned that I get phone calls from the, from the schools about fundraisers, but I was not told about this. I hope that the school committee was informed and involved in this decision to, to do this uh, investigation. I'm concerned that this was the avenue that was thought best to go uh, to investigate this situation. I'm concerned that for not just my son, but all of the 800 or so students at the high school now, and their parents, their families, find themselves in this situation. I'm concerned that the adults who are in charge of my son's safety did not put his future and his constitutional rights at the forefront. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in the public comment session? Okay, um, hearing none, we will then move on to the next item, which are announcements. Are there any announcements from the members of the school committee? Just, I have, I just wanted to take one minute. Um, as many of you know, last week, Northampton said goodbye to two retired guidance counselors and principals who served Northampton Public Schools for a combined total of 69 years. Mr. Robert Young and Ms. Uh, Kay Sheehan, uh, these two wonderful individuals helped shape the Northampton public school system into what it is today. They touched the lives of thousands of students, staff, and families. Although I did not know Mr. Young all that well, I know of many who did and who enjoyed listening to as many, and I enjoyed listening to many of the stories told about him either um, as his time as a guidance counselor or as a principal at one of the many schools here in town that he led. Ms. Sheehan, on the other hand, I had uh, the pleasure of knowing quite well. Her contributions to the lead school and the entire school system have been um, something that really has been wonderful and tremendous. What I'll remember most about Kay is the many conversations I had with her before and after Sunday Mass where she always sought me out to talk to me about a school-related topic. Most of all, I will remember her for the praise she always gave to me and to our committee for the countless hours of work we put into our schools. She always would end our conversations by saying how happy she was that I was a member of the school committee. And I know it's these words, these encouraging words that I will personally miss about her the most. And so at this time, I would ask that we all take a moment and remember these two fine educators for their services to our schools and to honor them with a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sasky. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Um, I did want to just uh, make one announcement and that was uh, Today we've uh, posted and you should be receiving electronic copies of it, of a joint meeting of the City Council and School Committee uh, that is called in accordance with our new Northampton Charter, uh, Section 7-2, Annual Budget Policy. It'll be held Thursday, January 31st at 7 p.m. here in the community room. Um, and, and by charter, it is a meeting at which the mayor uh, is required to review the financial condition of the city, uh, revenue and expenditure forecasts, and other relevant information in order to develop a coordinated budget. So it's essentially the, the kickoff of the budget season um, for the city of Northampton. 
Um, so that's new information. The other announcement I wanted to make was about the budget timeline because I know that that was a question um, at, at past meetings. So the January 31st meeting is that joint meeting of the City Council and School Committee. And again, using the dates that are now in the charter, the um, April 17th, 2013 is the date by which the um, adopted budgets of the Northampton Public Schools and the Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School uh, must be submitted to the mayor um, so that I can then prepare the overall city budget. And then May 16th is the date under by which uh, I must present uh, the FY 2014 budget to the city council. So the key date for the school committee is April 17th. Um, and we'll be publishing this schedule um, on the calendar, et cetera. But I, I wanted to let you know about that because I know that was an issue we've talked about. Any other announcements? Okay, we'll move on to the uh, next item, which is recommended actions. And uh, we have our consent agenda, which includes this evening <coughs> the approval of the minutes of the special school committee meeting held on Wednesday, December 5th, 2012. There are no contracts this evening. And then we have field trip requests uh, for the high school, E.O. Smith High School in Storrs, Connecticut on February 2nd, 2013. And again, for NHS, a field trip to Montreal, Canada, April 5th through 6th, 2013. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve it. Is there a second? Sorry. Okay. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda say. Uh, I just want to notice that the, one of the physics teachers is in the audience. Okay. I assume with the robotics field trip. Right. And I just wanted to thank you for doing that project. Uh, okay. Now, I, and I didn't hear that as one of the items to be considered, or is that uh, the robotics field trip request? It is. Yeah. Okay. Two That's field trips? To s oh, uh, did I not? We have them. Okay. Okay. March 7th and March 28th. Oh, okay, I did not read those because my agenda did, was not, did not include. So, yes, yeah, it does include the robotics trip to Worcester, March 7th through 9th, and the robotics trip to Hartford, March 28th and 30th, 2013. Sorry about that. Um, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the consent agenda is approved. Uh, we'll now move into reports and recommendations, and uh, I will ask our uh, student representative to deliver a student report for this month. Thank you. I want to start off by saying I hope everybody had a good holiday. Um, it was a much needed break for me to spend a week off, uh, to get away from school and spend time with the family, so I hope everybody else enjoyed their time. Um, I want to start off first off with something that's going on right now at the high school. Um, as we speak, is the One Axe Festival which is Steve Eldridge and his uh, productions of student-run uh, one acts, which are roughly about five to 15 minutes, some are a little bit longer. Um, and these are all student-run, all student-produced, and it's a recommendation um, for you to go see it, either uh, obviously not tonight, but tomorrow or on Saturday. They will be going on uh, throughout the night, so it is something that's um, very fun to watch. I've seen uh, these been going on for the last few days of the rehearsals, and they are very well done. Um, and the students have put a lot of effort towards these shows. Um, secondly is this weekend, I believe, is the AP prep session for science, which a lot of students, uh, as you know, take AP classes at the high school, and science is one of the uh, major ones besides English. And the math and science initiative that has been going on in Massachusetts has, very, uh, has helped us succeed a lot in these APs. Uh, and we've become second in the state for AP scores besides Boston Latin. And again, there is just some disproportion in terms of student size, but science has really, really, the students in the science class have s stepped up and tried their best, and they have succeeded very, very well. So it is something that um, the teachers take seriously and students take seriously. So this Saturday, there will be, will be a prep session at the high school for students who will be with their teachers, um, covering some of the material that they might not be able to cover throughout the courses because of advisories or because of some interruptions they won't be able to get to. So it is a good, a good weekend session for them to know this material, to get ready for this AP session, which will help them get credit for college, wherever they shall go. Um, also, next Thursday is the music and band um, <coughs> concert. And for those of you that were able to see in downtown Northampton on first night, the uh, Northamptons 
which practice very hard. The music productions, or the music and band is taken very seriously, and so their production next uh, Thursday will be a combination of the band and chorus, and I recommend you guys, you guys go see that because it is very, very well rehearsed. Uh, the band and Bo have put time into this for the last few months to rehearse for this and get this production ready. Um, they had a little blip with, of course, break where they weren't able to practice and rehearse, but they have gotten back to the swing of things and ready to go for this. Um, next Friday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day for us. Obviously, we don't have school on the following Monday uh, as a holiday. And so what SOCA, the Students of Color Association, is doing is showing us the movie Ruby Gates on next Friday for fourth period, and that is a school-wide assembly to see this movie, and it is based off um, an Afri African-American woman who was a student down in the South, and she was one of the first ones um, to go to school in a uh, segregated school, uh, or an in integrated school, excuse me. And so it was it is a very good film. We got a lot of uh, awards for this, and so it's something to kind of open our eyes to the situation, because a lot of students don't understand Martin Luther King Day in terms of its context. A lot of students just think it's a holiday off, and it's not really well celebrated like it should be, and dedicated as it should be. So that's something that uh, I cherish, not just to have to a period off to see a movie, it's actually to learn and to understand more about this situation that's going on. And um, I find it interesting, and I enjoy to see, oh, will enjoy seeing that. Um, also, next, uh, it's actually, excuse me, on February 7th, there's going to be, it's the second inter generation panel discussion, which is members of the Northampton Council on Aging and members of Northampton High School will have a meeting in the library at Northampton High School to discuss about what it's like to be a teenager. And this is something I was able to experience last year, and something that it, last year there was about seven members of the student on, um, on the Council on Aging that came, and it's just for them to understand what it's like for us to be a student at Northampton High School, and to kind of ask them questions about what it was like for them to be a student, to be a teenager, and kind of compare and contrast and have this relationship with members of the community who we don't really get to see that often or who we don't, we don't have this interaction with who are still supporting us and the city of Northampton. So it's good for both students and the Council on Aging to kind of have this connection um, during school because we aren't obviously able to. When was that date again? It's yeah. February 7th. February 7th and it's yeah. done during school hours? Yes, it's during school hours. And then January 26th, which is next Saturday, our academic team is going to Everett High School to perform in the Mass History Bowl. And this academic team was also went to Williston, I believe, it was mid-December, and they actually beat Williston in an academic tournament. And so that was something that our team is very proud of and our school is proud of, that they performed so well. And they have studied very hard. It is very hard for them to um, know. If you have seen these academic bowls before, there is a lot of stuff that you need to know, and they have done an absolutely great job. And there is actually, there is, it is comprised of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And there's freshmen who have tried their best with school, becoming a freshman, and joining on the team. So it is um, kudos to them for doing so well on this. Um, and then also, in terms of academics, from a week and a half from now, our semester one is closing. So teachers are wrapping up their semester one, and I, I, I think it's a general consensus from a lot of teachers is that they haven't had enough time to teach what they want. And you'll see this every semester. The teachers say, I've had less time than I did this from the semester before. And whether that is actually true or not, it has seemed that there is either more material they need to cover or just less time they have or both. And so um, something that I think is good for what I, the classes I've had is the teachers have been able to stay on top of it with some of the breaks in the schedule, whether it be a snow day, whether it be assembly or advisories. They have been able to pick up the pace, keep the students on track, and be able to finish their classes and be able to grade by this time because obviously I don't know what it's like to be a teacher, but I can say from being close to the, some of the faculty members just the upcoming week and getting their final grades in for seniors who, any senior that has a 90 in a class as an average doesn't have to take the final, which is a good perk as a senior because you do not want to take some of the finals, let me tell you. Um, but it is good for us to have the experience to, to take the finals, but these teachers have to get grades in on one Friday, the day after they have two days of finals, and get ready for the next semester, all in one Friday. So. I, I support them in whatever they choose to do, whether take, having me take a final or not, having to do my grades, they, they deserve it, they work hard, they have a full week of school, we have Monday and Friday off, 
but they're still back in there on Friday, Friday morning, getting our grades done and getting those sent in. So that I, I give them a lot of credit for that. The last thing I want to touch on is something that was referenced before, and that was the events prior to <coughs> December break. And I want to discuss this as a student that experienced this and went through this. Um, starting off is the week prior, or following the events at Sandy Hook, we did observe a moment of silence for the victims of Sandy Hook. And I think that was something that was needed to be done and was obviously well done. And after that, of course, there was incidents at the high school that prompted uh, the police to be present. And I can say that the police presence did its job in terms of making us feel comfortable. As a student in the high school, you do get taken back by the events that happened at Sandy Hook. I don't think it's, it's evident that no matter if you are a student or a teacher, a parent, you were taken back what, by what happened. And you had to rethink of the safety of being in school. And for me, it was short-lived because I feel safe in school. I feel very comfortable with the teachers and my fellow students at school. I'm spending eight hours a day sometimes for 180 days with these students, with these teachers. It is my second home. I spend more time at the school than I almost do at home on a daily basis. And so I have to put some sort of trust, some belief in the people around me that I will be safe, and I do. And coming into school, seeing Ms. Athens with the police chief and other police presence around the school, um, you start to think if something bad could happen, but it ends very quickly because you felt safe. I, there was not a moment after that that I didn't feel comfortable going to class, coming to school, seeing my friends, walking around the hallways during passing time. It was, I felt safe and I felt that anything, anything that came up in me that I felt scared, I felt nervous, I could go to a teacher to talk to them. And I think that's what they wanted to be done to know that we could go to anybody in the building and tell them that we feel safe. And obviously there are some parents that are still concerned, um, some faculty that are still concerned. But as a student, I feel more, more safe than I did before the break, and more safe than I did before the, uh, the police presence. And if that was the goal of the police presence, it's did its job. If it wasn't, it's another part because I, I just feel that what has happened has made the school more unified and more of a community because we are a community. Like I said before, we're a family. We spend a lot of our time together. And so being able to go to school and know that I will be safe is a very good feeling. And it's something that I treasure now. And it's disappointing to leave, going to be leaving as a senior um, to start new in a, and be in a giant university. but. The community that is at Northampton High School is stronger than it was before break, and I can tell you that personally, that as a student, I feel closer to every member, whether it be faculty or student, in the school now than I have ever had in my four years at the high school. So um, some people might think it is scary what has happened, and the debate will go on on all these different political issues, but in terms of how the students feel right now, is that we are not worried about what happened. We are going on with our lives, we are moving on in school, we are focusing on our schoolwork, and we are focusing on being able to be a community at Northampton High School. So for those who worry about the emotional toll on us, um, as of now, a lot of us aren't worried about it. We are worried about doing good in school and being a teenager, being a kid, and that's what really matters right now. And I think faculty and the board has done a great job of making that seamless for us. So I thank you for that, and hopefully this will continue to be something I'm comfortable with and love going to school every day. So thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you very much for that report. Thank you. OK, the next item on the agenda is uh, the acceptance of a gift. And this is uh, from the uh, uh, Northampton Education Foundation's SOS Book Fund. And uh, my friend Joe Bartolomeo is here from the uh, NEF board uh, to make his annual uh, a presentation around the SOS Book Fund. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure once again to present the annual check for the SOS Book Fund. As I'm sure you all know, the Book Fund goes, as its title suggests, for textbooks, library books, 
and their higher tech equivalents. Uh, and uh, it's allocated on a per capita basis based on the recommendations of the school councils of each school and that approved by the NEF board. I like to mention every year the principal sources of funding. Uh, there are two. The first is the annual census appeal. And I can say that just this week, the students from the National Honor Society helped fold 12,000 envelopes uh, to put into that appeal this year. Uh, the second is the annual plant sale on the day before Mother's Day, May 11th, at Smith Volk. This year, thanks to the generosity of our friends and neighbors, we were able to allocate $7 per student for a grand total of $18,438. So I have that for you today. Thank you. Right. Yes, take, take flu precautions. Thank you, Joe. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe, and thank you to, uh, to NEF and to all the folks who work so hard to uh, raise this funds. Um, I want to ask for a motion from the school committee uh, to accept this gift in the amount of $18,438. I move to accept the gift. Okay. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion or any? With gratitude, thank you. With gratitude, okay. Um, I'm disappointed that you didn't come with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so there's been a motion made and seconded uh, to accept this uh, gift gratefully. And all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, the uh, next item on the agenda is uh, uh, reports from the Rules and Policy Subcommittee on a couple of different policies, and I'll turn it over to the Chair of Rules and Policy. Okay. Uh, technology Acceptable Use Policy is the first on my agenda. Okay. Yeah. Um, this has come... It, uh, Let's see, Angelo Rocha, our technology director, brought this to us last, late last fall, and we almost didn't like anything about it. So we, <laughs> because it basically included a lot of procedures and it was written not in the, in the same vein, the same tone as our normal school committee policies. So we sent him back to the drawing board with a lot of um, recommendations and requests, and he came back to us, um, when was it, December? I mean, uh, November. December. December with a revised recommendation, and we just pretty much couldn't find anything wrong with it. We like it very much. It's clear that um, the, the goal here is to encourage use of technology while still maintaining um, enough structure and enough control that we don't allow students to uh, access information that we don't believe is appropriate. It, we encourage students to be careful consumers of the information in that we ask them to realize that there is misinformation available on the internet. It's also uh, designed the, the policy is designed to cover all users, which is to say both students and faculty. And so there is some, there are, there are some guidelines about faculty members who are creating um, websites or who are using social network sites for in educational and instructional purposes. So he's, he did a very good job of trying to integrate a lot of components into one policy and also to be forward thinking enough that we don't have to change it in six months or hopefully even a year. I, I think he's done a good job. So I move and the Rules and Policy Committee recommends approval of the acceptable use policy for staff and students. Is there a second to Does, that? Actually, do we have to have it two readings? Okay, so this is really just the first one. So for, I withdraw my motion. Okay. So this is really just your first view of it, but we are recommending it. Okay. So, and if you have any questions or concerns or suggestions, you can 
get in touch with me or with Annie and we will consider So this will come back at come the back future meeting for an actual, February. for a vote. I'm okay. sorry, I forgot we do two readings and policies. Okay. So um, are there any comments or questions about it at this point uh, for the for committee members? Okay, hearing none. Uh, the next policy that you have to present is the health policy for the physical exam of students. And I notice our school health yes. director is here. This policy is covering um, some of the required tests that we do of students. Um, I think, I, I, yeah, it would be most helpful if Karen would stand up okay. and explain it to you, the background of it. Okay, so we'll recognize uh, Karen Jarvis Vance, our city's health director, school health director. All right, um, we decided to revise this policy based on uh, new recommendations that continue to come down from the Department of Public Health around screening of students. So our old policy was very specific in naming screenings, hearing, vision, postural. Now we have new, uh, well, we've always done height and weight, but we're now required by law to do height and weight and calculate BMI and report that to parents. And it is foreseeable in the future that a, a new screening may be recommended or a screening may be taken away. So all this is is a revision of the policy, first to add a nice vision philosophy statement, um, and then to make it more broad in saying that we're just going to adhere to the recommendations of the Department of Public Health as it applies to screenings and reporting to parents. So that in the future, whether they take away a screening or add a screening, we won't have to constantly revise the policy. That's the gist of it. When she said make it more broad, I think we were we were trying to clarify how data would be used, any data that we right. collect. Well, we added that that piece of it that um, that we actually use the data that is collected in the aggregate, non-identifiable, to improve the health of our students. That was added in there as well. Do you have a question, Mr. Matt? A couple. This is just the first reading, right? So, yes. Yes. I had a couple of comments. One was um, that when I read it initially, this is just a writing thing, uh, the physical exam paragraph, I guess paragraph, uh, is that two or three? Um, it, I was not clear if that was, if that was included in the screenings that are performed in the school or if the screenings, you know, in other words, it, it, it didn't sort of, it wasn't set off enough as being separate from those screenings. Which physical I, the screenings exams. are all happening in the schools with school nurses. Right. right? Physical exams are sometimes as well. So but, this policy is meant to cover screenings and physical exams. But in general, the physical exams are done by children's doctors. That's what we would prefer, but occasionally they are done in the schools. And that's what's not really clear. And when I read this, it was, I don't know, it just, it was a little confusing. It didn't state that clearly that we, you know, the required, you know, um, so if we the school nurse keeps the copies. Sends, if these are done by your private doctor, the school nurse will review and keep copies. Something like that, or we encourage them to be done by your private doctor. I, I just, just actually say that because I think that I know that's the policy, but it should say that. Or we could even put in the last sentence of the first paragraph when it says school screenings under this policy, school screenings and, and physical exams under this policy are intended to supplement, not yeah. supplant oversight of care by the student's primary care provider. We could add it there as well. Except that makes it sound as though the physicals aren't being done by the regular care provider, and they usually are. So I, I don't know. Just so our screening. To address that. Because sometimes we don't do screenings oh, really? on students if they've been done. It's the same thing. Oh, really? Yeah. I always I knew about the screenings happening. Screenings often are done by the physician as well during mm -hmm. a physical exam. So a lot of students are exempted from scoliosis screening. A lot of our preschoolers are exempted from vision screening because it's mm -hmm. been done because we prefer it to be done by the regular. Okay, well, so I guess I, I think that should, needs to be somehow rather stated clearly in here. So it's, and then the other one I had a real question about was this, the last paragraph. I don't even, how, how would the school physician determine that they are going to examine a school employee? Who refers them? The uh, nurses do. Okay, well, I think it should say and that. And that's then, not a change from the school the, physician right. just, you know. It's not a change from the original poli policy. That's not know, any sort of change. I think it maybe ought to be changed because it's not clear who the referral is by. 
just sort of seemed like a very odd thing. I mean, like in his opinion, I've got to go examine this employee. You know? <laughs> Generally in the case of uh, some sort of outbreak of disease. Right, I understand that. So, but I wonder if uh, also, I didn't notice this previously, but protection of the student's health may require it. I wonder if that should be a plural possessive. It should be. It should. Here's the apostrophe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Or it could just be of student health. Okay. Get rid of the preposition as well. Right. So, so we have two requests to revise this, which we can look at on Monday if we get through the rules procedure in time, <laughs> and bring back to you revised policy. Okay. Great. Are there Thanks. any other questions for Ms. Jarvis Vance? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other item? Any other issues from rules and policy? Hearing none, I will move on to a report of the Budget and Property Subcommittee and Mr. Zahowski. Okay, uh, we met recently and uh, there isn't a whole lot to report, but I will hit the highlights. We did go once again and look at the FY13 budget and uh, then we heard in, uh, in and around the capital improvements that um, were submitted and I believe Mayor, they passed through second reading last Thursday, is that correct? That is correct, yes. So um, those that were presented to us at our last meeting and discussed at our subcommittee meeting, that money has been approved for those capital projects for this year. I can go through those if you'd like, um, uh, but I, I won't if you don't want me to, but. Um, so this I, whole list? So the whole list that you had last month, those capital projects have been funded um, through capital improvements. So that was one that was $100,000 for technology improvements, $44,000 for a ground maintenance dump truck, uh, $24,000 for portable generator and transfer switches, also the $12,500 for the video surveillance system at the Northampton High School. Those were the cameras that were donated from the police station, um, the old police station that will now be installed at the high school. Ryan Road School, 15,000 for some chimney repair stacks, or some chimney stack repairs. So that was good news, and we're, we're grateful to capital improvements in the city for allocating those funds to our schools for those upgrades and improvements. And we did lastly talk about the FY14 budget process and how it's changed now under the ch charter, trying to uh, start to think about some timelines and how we're going to go about scheduling meetings and um, trying to create a, a budget without having certain information and numbers in place. Um, and so I think that's about it. Howard or Stephanie, anything to add? I would only just underline, I think we all know it, but make sure everybody's really clear about the, that the 100000 for the technology was really the first part of a, essentially a three-year plan and, and it will be spent on the most important but also the least visible components of technology, so infrastructure within the schools in terms of um, various sorts of switches and things which you can't actually use until you get some more equipment later, but that you can't use that other equipment unless you have it first. So really important for people to understand that when we're looking to purchase additional technology next year, it is actually the continuation of this year's policy. It's not more. The request, the original, the request to the Capital Improvements Committee was 300000 Correct. We were only able to fund 100000 in this round. So essentially the first phase of, of actual patch. That's my hope. Yes. Uh, any other questions regarding budget, um, the Budget and Property Committee report? Okay. So then we'll move on to the Business Manager's report and Mr. McLaughlin. A couple noteworthy items, uh, one that we just talked about was the capital plan. Um, the total of all the monies uh, that were approved on the individual products or the individual projects is $195,500. So out of all the capital monies that had been approved, we have $195,000 for those projects as uh, Mr. Sahowski had uh, explained. Uh, we're also scheduled on another note uh, for a district audit, just as a reminder by the Department of Ed that's coming up on January 31st. 
they'll be coming here to do an audit. It's one of those we've been randomly picked, and they're coming out to pay us a visit and see how we're doing. <laughs> um, contracts, a rare, a rare night. We have none. Um, financial, <coughs> the financial statement you have is in your package. Uh, there are still some items that are in there that are still being reviewed, some items that are under budget, and there's a couple that are over budget. But I'll be going into a more detailed forecast on specific line items when we get to our budget and property meetings and we start delving into each of the line items and start discussing the various uh, uh, areas where either we could save or we know we might be a little bit over. That is That will be coming up. On that financial, we're about 43.4% uh, spent for the whole year. That's pretty much on target where we are right now in January, give or take uh, a point or two. But uh, that's a pretty good percentage of uh, being on target. So if you did the math and you knew of a few of the nuances that happened behind the scenes, um, we're right there in how we're spending. Uh, we do have a couple of um, unplanned expenses coming up because of a, a few nights that we've been really cold down into the zero category. Um, at the high school we've had a few broken pipes. Mm -hmm. So we've had some water leakage, we've had some uh, re-instituting of uh, glycol type substances in the system, we've had some repairs, there's been some labor incurred. Um, I think we've hit most of the weak spots that we've been able to identify with our contractor. But it's one of those unfortunate instances that have happened. We've addressed it, and we're back up and running. Student information systems. We're continuing our review of the, the companies that we think best fit our district. And just to throw out a couple of names, and I don't know if they mean anything to all of you, but IPASS is the name of a company, Power School, Aspen, uh, Infinite Campus, and Ritiker. Um, those are the vendors that we are seeing their demos and reviewing what options they have for us. And Ms. Minnick, follow up on your request from last, uh, last month. We did talk to the collaborative. They do carry some licenses that we can piggyback into. Um, I don't know if they will apply to our situation, but they do have licenses that are available that they can share <coughs> with participating communities. And we did check in uh, with them. They're going to come back and give us some details to see if one of these vendors, I think, qualify under that. So we will use that in our process of evaluation. Uh, the capital plan, you heard that. That was just discussed. I don't need to reiterate that. Um, the budget status, we're still analyzing different things for FY13. Uh, I know there's still been talk about 9C cuts coming out. I think everything still stays pretty much status quo in the 9C cuts. There's nothing really drastic that I have seen come to my desk that's going to change anything that I've talked about in the past. And we'll be meeting with budget and property, um, hopefully shortly after the mayor comes out with his guidelines as to how we proceed. Uh, in the budget process. Thank you. Um, personnel report. I believe you. First, can I ask a question? About oh, sure, certainly. Certainly. Oh, uh, this is a question that came up uh, from Bridge Street School regarding the budget freeze, mm -hmm. and um, the fact that they have not got somebody sitting at the front desk. You know, the person who buzzes people in through the door, mm -hmm. and uh, because she retired in October, I think. And so it has not been, that position hasn't been replaced due to the freeze. Um, but they really need someone there. That person is also the person who supervises kids who are sent to the office for time out and so on. So they, they really are having a problem with not having a person there to do these rather straightforward tasks. I know they've had some substitutes in filling in uh, to cover on that position. And I know uh, we have uh, received the retirement of one of the individuals at Bridge Street that will be retiring at the end of the year. Uh, we do have some monies because if the position was originally budgeted for, right. unless the principal at the school had shifted those monies, no, I which I don't think she has. Right. So I think right now she's filling with substitutes in that position. Um, I have not talked with her in the last couple of weeks just due to other things, but I can give her a call and find out if 
she needs to expedite that process or she hasn't found somebody to fit that position or not? I, I don't, my understanding was that she was under the impression that she could not fill it. If it's a replacement, yes. If it's a brand new position, no. No, that would no it's, a, it's an old position, it's an existing position. She should have money if it's an well, she, She's position. under the understanding that she can't replace it as a result of the budget freeze. So perhaps you should I'll call, call her. her. I'll straighten it out for <laughs> Are there any other questions for Mr. McLaughlin regarding the business manager's report? Okay. Personnel report? Uh, personnel report, you have uh, the new hires that have been brought on for the month of December. You've seen a, a couple of separations that have been noted uh, in, in the report. No retirements as of December and no promotions or transfers. So it was a, um, a smaller, lower month of activity. Okay. Uh, then finally, we have a report uh, from Johanna McKenna on the DIP progress. You may want to let us know what, what yes, the, I what will. The dip district. <laughs> I'm usually up presenting the school improvement plan, but this is the district improvement plan, and it's just a progress update. Everything isn't finalized, and I'm not sure. Honestly, if this is the first time you've seen an update, or if this is this is the first time, okay. Um, so, if you recall at our retreat um, when we were developing the district improvement plan, um, we set up uh, three basic objectives. Um, one was deepen and refine the focus on instructional academic achievement to meet the needs of students and support teacher growth. That was one. The second one was to develop a plan to support arts, music, enrichment activities, sports, educa uh, sports education, and commit the resources, the financial resources necessary. And the third one was to build systems to support technology so that we can make use of data to evaluate and improve student achievement and expect teachers to use technologically innovative instruction. So those were the goals that um, kind of focus the district this year and so today um, and you'll see in the columns it gives you the the actual um, objectives that we were working on so I'm just going to quickly go down and if you have any questions um, by October 30th this is under in the first column deepen and refine the focus on instruction um, 50 percent of the faculty from each school will be participating in the mass um, evaluation the new mass teacher evaluation system that's been that's done 95% um, by September 2013 95% of all fifth and sixth grade students will receive standards based math instruction within the inclusion setting and a co-teaching model there's significant progress made there's a lot of inclusion happening uh, we are still working on uh, the co-teaching aspect of it um, because part of that has to do with scheduling, but um, by and large, this, the majority of uh, fifth and sixth grade students are receiving math instruction in the regular classroom setting. Um, by uh, the next one, by September uh, 2013, benchmark assessments will be identified, developed, and implemented K to 12. Um, those are in the major content areas uh, reading, math, um, science. And what they are basically doing is tracking students' progress over a period of months so that teachers have um, a good sense and can give that to the parents of what progress students are making as they go through the curriculum. Um, right now, we have been making have some progress on that, so it, but it's not even. Um, the school, JFK, actually has made significant progress in developing benchmarks across all the curriculum areas. Um, the elementary schools have benchmark assessments available for um, literacy and we're fine-tuning a benchmark assessment for mathematics and um, the high school is is working on theirs so they're they're kind of just beginning um, the process so I it, we've made some progress um, but it's it's kind of uneven at this point the next one is um, during the 20 uh, the 2012-13 evaluation cycle, all faculty will incorporate 
as part of their, um, this is their individual professional development plan. That's what IPDP stands for. And it's required now under the new evaluation system that all teachers have a um, professional development plan. One goal focused on the implementation of the curriculum frameworks. That's done. That was done as a part of the evaluation process with the uh, principals. By January 13, uh, 2013, faculties at a grade level will have identified three standards from each of the uh, 2011 mass frameworks in English language arts and math in need of improvement based on anal analysis of the MCAS data in each school. Um, and uh, that's also, so the, every, in that um, column under instruction, we have, um, sig most, they're all done except for um, the co-teaching inclusion for math. There's significant progress. And the benchmarking assessments, we've made a lot of progress, but it's still not um, complete. Yes? I said a question about the benchmark assessments. I mean, eventually, you'll have this matrix which will be through the year and by subject and then by grade. And I'm wondering could, if you could share that with us as an, even if it's a work in progress just for us to see how this is coming together and maybe get a sense of how faculty in different subject areas and in different buildings are coordinating so that you know assessments are not all piled on top of each other and so that you know they're getting useful data and so that you know each of the subjects I guess has a, a chance to gather the data and then respond to it appropriately. So I'd be really interested in seeing as that matrix comes together. Um, That's a great idea. A you know, just a you know, even a provisional of, of where it stands would well, be great. I can see. basically say now that for the benchmarks, it's usually a th happens at three points in the year: mm -hmm. the beginning of the year, sometime around January, February, and at the end of the year. Right. Um, and in the middle, there is what's what are called progress monitoring where teachers are, might be giving quizzes or might be collecting data right. kind of in the middle. But the goal of doing that is so that you don't come to the end of the year and realize some student has really missed, you know, and it's going to fail the class. You know, we have plenty of time to, you know, give them the information and maybe change up the instruction so that the, you keep them on track to complete the, uh, the course. So yeah, uh, we could give you that information. Any other questions on that the, that particular column? Okay, the next column is around all around schedules <clears throat> and um, figuring out how we can uh, infuse arts music and arts music enrichment activities and sports education into the uh, um, relatively short academic school day. So um, there's been some progress on expanding the length of the school day. I think this is also tied up a little bit into in the discussions that we've been having about the high school start time and lengthening the time. In the, Never uh, heard of it. <laughs> Never heard of that part. Um, and lengthening um, the time in the elementary schools. So there's been some progress, but this is still an ongoing um, discussion that's um, happening. Also, um, it's a, uh, the next one was the school committee will engage in collaborative bargaining in an effort to create a schedule that includes duties for teachers at all levels. Um, again, I'm putting some progress about this. this isn't something that the um, administration can do directly, um, but I know that we're um, supportive of this effort. And um, the next one is Examining, develop a committee to examine the effectiveness of the school schedule at each building with the goal of providing more time for art, music, and electives and community service learning. And actually, there's been uh, significant progress in this. Um, each one of the buildings basically has a, um, a schedule committee, and they're looking at um, how to best use the time in their buildings and uh, figure out how to. Um, make sure that we're effectively using the academic time um, and hopefully once that piece is done will be possible to figure out how to infuse more of the um, the arts programs in um, 
So I think, you know, there's been a lot of progress in that area in each, at the building level. <coughs> Extend the hours of all libraries and computer labs for up to an hour from the end of the school day. That's been done. That was done. We, did, we just kind of decided that in September. So all the school libraries are available for student use um, after the school day. I had a question about that. How, are, how is that being staffed? It's not being staffed. So they're simply Except open. for volunteers. But they're available. So they are open. They are open. We can't afford to staff it except for volunteers. Yes. Can I ask you about the, when you say infuse some of these other activities into the school day, are you speaking of creating slots of time for those things, or are you talking about integrated disciplines? Oh, I'm not talking about, I mean, it would be nice to do integrated <laughs> I'd uh, love to discipline music in math class or whatever. But, I know. Yeah. Um, but no, we, we would be talking more about really finding, stretching the amount of time that we have for, say, art, music, and PE so that kids get actually more instruction, um, or adding additional courses maybe at the high school. I mean, does the, do the curriculum frameworks in the new Cullen Core allow for that kind of interdisciplinary approach? Yes, they do. Absolutely, they do. And um, so what's, what's the roadblock to that? Is it really just time for teachers to prepare those lessons and the availability or the interest, or is it? I would say that it's, you know, is what, is, thing what is really a time thing? underfunded in addition to the library, yes. the library being open. Um, is time for, t it, it's just a considerable amount of time for teachers to develop units that are like that. And um, as, you all, as you know, the, there's a limited amount of preparation time that teachers have during a school day, and the optimal time to do things like that is in the summertime when people can have more um, concentrated time to work with their colleagues. The problem with that is financial too, is finding the money to support that work in the summertime. It's very challenging to do it during a school year. Uh, okay. Any other questions about that column? Okay. The last column is building systems to support technology. So the first one is done. Um, people are, have been, principals have been identifying effective uses of technology and finding teachers that are willing to share their expertise <coughs> with their colleagues in how they're using technology in the classroom. Um, and teachers did go to workshops that was last summer. Um, there's been some progress on the next one, which is um, developing a district technology plan. <coughs> um, right now, as you know, Angela's been really busy in uh, learning about and then trying to um, assess the areas of need, particularly in hardware, um, to make sure that the district has the hardware capacity to do what we want to do with technology, and that's really been um, the focus of the work that he's been doing so far. And the third one is the school committee will prioritize funding for the technology department, and that is also being done. That's part of um, our request to the city for capital uh, funds to support technology, which they were so kind enough to approve. On the next page, um, by October 12, uh, 2012, we will make a decision on new student information system. As Mark McLaughlin mentioned in his report, we are still in the process of that, so we've made significant progress, but we haven't made a final decision because I think at the end of, by the end of the month, they will have all the vendors will have made their presentation, so I expect it will be fairly soon um, that the decision will be made, but we missed the deadline of October. <laughs> um, administrators and teachers will use current and developing technology tools um, to improve communication, websites, calendars. That's being done. Um, Angelo is migrating us into Google, um, the Google Docs and Google Apps and all of those. Um, shared calendar things which we haven't had in the past um, which will be really um, significant in improving efficiency the administrative efficiency and communication and data teams all the schools have data teams and they have been receiving
training and analyzing the data at the school level, and they'll be using that data um, to inform their school improvement plans, and that's, that's considered. <coughs> so, you know, I think that the new, strat the new um, SMART goals process that uh, we use for developing the district improvement plan and the, and the school improvement plans have really helped keep the um, system focused, I think, on what were our main goals. And um, so I think it was a very useful process in a very uh, positive format. So any questions about technology? This, um, <coughs> did this district improvement plan get decided on? Do you remember? Or was that from our retreat? Was it in the well, we decided on we decided on the goals on the retreat. And that was August. It was early August. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. No, you know, actually, yeah. I think the first time we had the retreat um, was not in the summer. I think we were working on. Um, some of the objectives in the summer. It was before the summer. With, with the, maybe January? Yeah. So, this yeah. was, so this is a year old, this document? Yes. Okay. So I, I'm just, um, one, I'm, I'm thrilled to get a, a, um, a midterm kind of report. I don't think we've ever had anything like that before. I don't think we've ever had such a, quite a clear plan like this before either. And I'm just, I'm, it, it's, it's really impressive to hear that we're pretty much staying on track with things, and it's it's um, great yeah. to have somebody leading that. Thank you. I know. Well, it's what's great about it is that's why I think was so powerful about this particular plan was because it made it very easy to not only keep ourselves focused, but also to document the actual work that got accomplished. It wasn't a, as sort of open-ended as uh, the formats that we had been using before. It's a combination of measurable goals and a timeline. It's all in one there, and it really, I guess, has kept you, kept you on task. It, you know, yes, it has, and the superintendent is very good at that. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments or questions for Ms. McKenna? Thank you very much. Very Thank you for the presentation. Okay, so that um, concludes our series of reports and recommendations. Uh, I do not believe we have any new business uh, this evening. Uh, well, I, Mr. Moore. I do have some questions regarding the, um, the evidence, or I guess it was handwriting samples that were collected at the high school. And I'd, essentially, I, I, I may, can I make a statement about it? Yeah, I don't think we have any. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I, I'm not really, the, the superintendent obviously is not here, mm -hmm. and, um, and I know that uh, this is something that the, um, Police and the administration, and uh, particularly the building administration at the high school, had worked together on. So no, I'm not interested so much in what's in the past. It's more um, because I mean I think there are serious issues there. But the the, the thing that I want to sort of address now has to do with the evidence that you know this was collected from 800 people who most certainly all were completely innocent, no suspicion of guilt, and um, it. It is currently in the possession of, I assume, the district attorney or the FBI or Homeland Security or our police department. I don't know. Um, but it, I think it would be very important for it to be returned to the schools. Thank you for that statement. Thank you. Um, any other items or issues under new business? OK. Um, so there are a listing of future business and meeting dates on the agenda. Obviously, we've heard the Rules and Policy Subcommittee will be meeting on Monday, January 14th at 1 p.m. in the central office uh, building at uh, 212 Main Street. Uh, the Budget and Property Office uh, Subcommittee will also be meeting. Uh, will be meeting on Thursday, January 24th at 4 p.m. in the central offices, also 212 Main Street. Um, the Special School Committee. Well, I'll also interject, there's the joint uh, school committee city council meeting on January 31st, 7 p.m. here in the community room. Uh, there's a special school committee slash alt district improvement plan meeting scheduled for Tuesday, February 5th at 6.30 p.m. here at JFK. And then we're back to your uh, regular meetings of for February 14th at 7.15 p.m. here at JFK. 
Um, so that's the upcoming future business meeting dates. Uh, I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. Okay. All those in favor of adjourning the meeting say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The meeting is adjourned.